Oh, hello. We're recording already. I was trying to fix that, that, the light thing. I don't like it, but I don't know how to fix it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, hi team. Um, you guys ready to debunk some more young earth creationism? Cause I sure am. I thought today we would take a look at a short little video from Answers in Genesis. I know it's everyone's favorite apologetics. And look, they have radiometric dating. I know this link has been selected, so it looks like I've watched this before, but I haven't watched this before. But it's only three minutes and 43 seconds. So, I thought we would take a look. Let's take a look, shall we? Um, here we go. Here we go. Let's, you wanna play this video for me? Answers in Genesis? Ooh, oh. Doesn't car okay, carbon-14 at dating. That's a different kind of radioactive dating, radiometric dating. Um, the half-life of carbon-14, what is it, decay to nitrogen? Uh, sorry, team, um, I thought this was gonna be uranium lead. That's okay, I know stuff about carbon-14 dating. Um, I just sometimes forget the details off the top of my head, but we can look it up and that's just fine. Okay, so carbon-14 decay equation or reaction. That's a fun one. Great. Here we go. I want this picture. Here we go. Um, open image and new tab. Hmm. Brilliant. My face is in the way. Let's move my face. Okay. My face is in the way again. Brilliant. So um, yeah, let's talk about how we read uh, this type of format. So this is read as six carbon 14. Um, why do we read it that way? And why is it written that way? So the letter or the series letters is going to represent the chemical symbol, right? So C for carbon, N for nitrogen, it would be U for uranium, PB for lead, just our shorthands that we know what we're talking about. I've got my afternoon coffee to keep me fueled for this. So I'm stoked. Six represents the number of protons. And if you guys remember from high school chemistry or whenever you learned, took a physical science last, um, if we change the number of protons, we're gonna change the element. So carbon always has six protons. So you can't have like seven carbon, right? Because if we have seven protons, then we are nitrogen. But six protons, carbon, and then what does this 14 mean? Well, 14, the number up here represents the total number of nucleons in the nucleus. Nucleons is the name for things in the nucleus, very cleverly named, but it is protons and neutrons. So there are 14 things in the nucleus of this carbon atom. Six of them are protons, meaning 14 minus six is eight. Eight of them are neutrons. This overall is not a super stable state. Um, we have more neutrons than we do protons and when having more neutrons than protons is unstable is, is a function of how many protons you have. But for carbon, which doesn't have a whole, this is a pretty small element, right? Not something like uranium that has uh, 238 nucleons, right? So what this means is that this atom, this atom of carbon-14, would be in a more stable state from a very like nuclear physics sense of stability if it were to turn one of those neutrons into a proton. So the process by which we turn a neutron into a proton is beta minus decay. Um, there is a video on my channel about beta minus decay uh, if you want to know more about how that works. Um, but 
we turn the new proton, excuse me, nope, we turn a neutron into a proton in the process, we're going to release an electron or a beta minus particle and an anti-neutrino. Um, for more details as to why that process happens the way it does, um, please just check out that video. Um, but the thing I want you to point, I want to point out here for you guys is that notice that in my nitrogen atom, this is my daughter isotope here, this nitrogen 14, our total number of nucleons has not changed. We still have 14 things in the nucleus, but now seven of them are protons, meaning the remaining seven things are neutrons. So when carbon-14 decays to nitrogen-14, we take a neutron from that carbon atom, we turn it into a proton. By turning it into a proton, we also make an electron and an anti-neutrino. The electron and the anti-neutrino are emitted, spit out of the nucleus, released to go run havoc on the world. This process has a half-life of about 6,000 years. And um, we can reliably measure half-lives to about 10. So carbon-14 can be used to radiometrically date things with carbon in them. So organic material that is as old as 60,000 years. After that, they get pretty unreliable. Um, and then the, yeah. So I think we'll leave, we'll put a pin in that for there. This is the process we're gonna talk about. We kind of have a basic understanding of when we can use it. And now let's pop back over to their video and see what they're going to say. Um, and this is from Dr. Andrew Snelling. So this is somebody new, um, but granted we're at AIG and not World Video Bible School. So we got different, different people. I, okay, I'm curious. I'm sorry, I haven't even played the video yet, but I wanna see who Dr. Andrew Snelling is. Dr. Andrew Snelling answers in Genesis. Who is this lovely human? Um, oh, oh, yes. Okay, I knew I'd heard that name. He is a geologist. Okay, so he is a geologist. So in theory, he knows things about radiocarbon dating. Um, so let's see what he has to say. Play, please. 14 dating disprove the Bible. Does radiocarbon disprove the Bible? Absolutely not. In fact, we're going to see that it's a great asset to us. But let's discuss what radiocarbon and dating is all about. Very briefly, I'm very proud of them for telling me what this guy has a PhD in there on screen. So he already they already get more points uh, than World Video Bible School did because they have an expert here. In theory, we have an expert. We've got a guy with a PhD in geology talking about um, radiometric dating, which is definitely something if you're a geologist, you should understand. Um, and they put all of his credentials there on the screen. Um, so they do get credit for that. Um, let's see what he has to say. It's otherwise known as carbon-14 dating, and it is based on the carbon-14 atom. Radiocarbon, most people think... It'd be more correct to call that an isotope, not an atom. Um, because the most abundant form of carbon in nature is going to be carbon um, 12, which has six protons, six neutrons. Um, and then what we call different types of carbon, right? Those are isotopes. So um, it would have been more correct there to say isotope instead of atom, but that is being very nitpicky on my part. Of carbon 14 or radiocarbon as being used to date rocks. Well, in fact, you can't date rocks with radiocarbon for two reasons. One, that's a true statement. Um, you can't, rocks uh, generally are um, not, uh, uh, don't have a lot of carbon in them, right? They're not biological thing. That's not, they're not organic. There we go. Rocks are generally inorganic. We wouldn't expect them to have a whole lot of carbon. <laughs> because most rocks don't can contain carbon, but more importantly, Radiocarbon decays very rapidly. To give you, uh, put it in perspective, radiocarbon de decays so quickly that if every atom of the Earth was radiocarbon, within just one million years, there'd be no radiocarbon atoms left. It would all have decayed away. 
And that's, we already said, but it's half-life is. It's half-life is 6,000 years ish, give or take a few. Why geologists don't use radiocarbon to say date fossils, simply because the fossils they believe are millions of years old. And uh, I was involved in a research study recently where we took coal samples from coal that was 40 million years old, supposedly, down to coal that was supposedly 300 million years old. And we sent it to a major laboratory, a recognised university laboratory for radiocarbon, and every one of those coal samples contained radiocarbon, a detectable radiocarbon. And we fully expected that they would contain radiocarbon because most of the world's major laboratories have already reported radiocarbon in coal and limestone and fossils, but they, they don't think about it in terms of an age, a true age for the rocks. And it... So let's think about that for a second. Just, sorry, my nose itches. I know, it's so attractive on camera. But earlier in this video, I said that radiocarbon dating is only reliable back to about 60,000 years. So if you're trying to date something that's multiple millions of years old, that's using the wrong tool. So um, I, 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 if he, I'm maybe naive enough to say, if he says there was measurable amounts of radiocarbon in it, um, then cool, um, sure. But uh, uh, but everything I know about radiocarbon dating says that Ooh, if it's after 60, maybe 100,000 years, it's not reliable. And there's other things that make radiocarbon dating not reliable. I assumed he was going to get into that. If he does, we'll talk about it. Um, so he's already, but anyway, the experiment he just described, it's already, that's the wrong tool for that job. Um, that's, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just the wrong tool. Um, you know, let's, let's not bring, let's not bring a hammer when what we need is a saw or something. Those are the first two tools I could think of. No matter whether the coal was supposedly 40 million years old or 300 million years old, it had the same amount of detectable radiocarbon in it and it gave a young age of only tens of thousands of years. Which is what you would expect, right? If we know that we can, like radiocarbon dating is going to give us ages of no more than uh, 60 to 100,000 years, of course we would expect anything we date with that method to get answers in the range that it's okay to use that method for. Um, so what I'm interested in here is how you got radiocarbon into those coal samples, and I don't know that off the top of my head, um, but let's put a pin into that question. Um, so what, I, what I'm thinking is going on, what I'm thinking is going on is that um, we have these really these millions of years old coal deposits, and there if there is radiocarbon in them, then it wasn't the carbon the radiocarbon that was in them when they were formed. So some process had to happen to form new radiocarbon in those. If these were if these samples if the same process happened to both samples, then you could get the same amount of radiocarbon in both of the samples because like that process that added new radiocarbon happened presumably at the same time. That's what I'm thinking is probably what happened. Um, but let's put a pin into that. And if, uh, if we get through this video really quickly, maybe we will dig into what those coal samples are. Try to get some data. Similarly, I've collected uh, shells in rocks that are supposed to be 150, 120 million years old in Northern California. And they also give a radiocarbon age of tens of thousands of years. Now that makes sense because the coal was laid down during Noah's flood. It I'm not gonna just let him say things like that outright. But again, notice that he's just saying that the, he's using the wrong tool and got a weird answer, right? Um, so, so that's a non-point, if that makes sense. To me, that's just a non-point. He, he inappropriately used the dating method and is trying to, you know, so we, we have we have a problem with his methodology. If you've got a problem with the methodology, we can't even touch the results or the conclusions um, because we have to address the, because those results or those conclusions uh, mean nothing if the methodology to get to them um, is fundamentally flawed and the methodology he's using here, fundamentally flawed. So let's keep playing. Plants that were fossilized in beds 
during the flood. So they all were fossilised, buried and fossilised in the same year-long event. So we'd expect them to give the same radiocarbon age. Of course, that radiocar those radiocarbon ages are based on the assumption that radiocarbon has always been produced in the atmosphere at the rate we find today. Um, that is not true. Um, that's not true at all. We use, so radiocarbon is produced in the atmosphere when we've got carbon in the atmosphere, it interacts with incoming solar radiation, so that's incoming gamma rays. Um, let's take, let's see if we can't find a nice pretty picture for that reaction. Um, carbon-14 creation equation, maybe? Formation. So yeah, beautiful. Okay. Um. So. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So it's gonna look something, maybe something like this. Let's do open image and new tab again. Let's take a look at this guy. Nope, wait, that's what we just looked at. That's not what I wanted. This is what we want. Okay, perfect. Cool. So um, when we have, we've got, oh gosh, I was wrong. I misspoke earlier. I'm sorry, team. Anyway, we've got boring old nitrogen in the atmosphere. Um, we've got lots of nitrogen in the atmosphere, right? Like 70 plus percent of our atmosphere is nitrogen. Um, and when that nitrogen interacts with a loose neutron. Um, so there's got to be a reaction that happens before this, um, where it's going to be, that's what happens. The incoming solar radiation interacts with things in the atmosphere, causes a particle ejection reaction, spits out a neutron. If that wayward neutron interacts with, smacks into, um, by interacts I mean smacks into, a nitrogen-14 atom, then um, we get, um, it's going to like kick a proton. It's gonna kick a hydrogen atom out of that nitrogen atom and we'll end up with that carbon 14. But it's, it's produced in the atmosphere, but it has not been produced at constant rates. Um, this definitely changes. I'm trying to think, um, we have analogs that geologists and other uh, real smart science type humans look at to understand what that starting point for um, how much carbon-14 we started with uh, when an organic, actually with carbon-14, it's so we are made of mostly carbon, we got a lot of carbon in us, we're actually made of mostly water, not mostly carbon, but we've got a lot of carbon in us. We also eat things with carbon. So um, what we're interested in is how much carbon is in uh, something, is in a creature, when they die, because uh, that's when they're going to stop taking in new carbon-14 and new carbon in general. So once you stop eating, once you die, then the sort of that's when that clock starts for the uh, parent carbon-14 beta minus decaying into the daughter nitrogen-14. Hey team, editing Maddie here. So at this point, live Maddie was scourging the internet looking for the calibration curve for carbon-14, but I also could not for the life of me remember that term. Um, so what the calibration curve does is it accounts for the variable production of carbon-14 over the last 50-ish thousand years. Um, so we take things that we know how old they are and that have carbon in them and we're able to kind of figure out how much carbon-14 started in those uh, different organic materials and backtrack how much they started with given how old they are so we can account for variable production rates of carbon-14, which does vary with things like sunspot cycles and anything that would affect cosmic radiation. Okay, 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 back to live, Maddie. So he's saying that scientists that date things with radiocarbon dating assume that um, the rate at which carbon-14 is produced has been a constant, but even Wikipedia doesn't agree with that, good sir, Dr. Snelling. Um, so you'll have to excuse me if I don't believe you. I'm sorry, there's a truck driving by. We are in my garage after all. Okay.
know that the Earth's magnetic field was stronger in the past, which means that the greater carbon production rate would have been slower in the past. So that is actually true. Um, our magnetic field is currently weakening. A fun fact, about every, hmm, is it 14? Forget the number. Periodically, um, all I can think about right now is how fast Earth's crust recycles itself, which is about every 200 million years. Um, our, our magnetic field weakens, shuts off, and flips upside down way more rapidly than that. It happens very rapidly from a geologic time sense, I think on the order of magnitude of like 10,000 years. Um, order of magnitude 10,000 years. I forget the exact number and I don't want to look it up right now, but that's okay. So yes, so right now our magnetic field is weakening. Um, it will eventually sort of turn off and flip upside down and reappear um, and all of our compasses will work incorrectly. They'll all point to the South Pole instead of the North Pole. And that'll happen sometime over the next few thousand years. Yeah, but that's a well-known thing. Which means that those dates are highly inflated. When we take into account what the radiocarbon was like at the time of the... Those dates would only be highly inflated if we didn't take into account differences in carbon production, carbon-14 production, in time, my guy. Like, this is only a problem if we don't think about it. Okay, let's play. But those ages of tens of thousands years of years come down to about four to five thousand years. We even tested diamonds for right radio- I'd like to say how, why, um, how did you get it to those years, right? Like, show me some data. I like data. Show me some methodology because um, your methods, I'm already very sus of your methods, my guy. And found that they did contain radiocarbon. Diamonds are found inside the earth at very great depths, and they are part of the initial makeup of the earth. Um, diamonds, yeah, diamonds are found, can be found very great depths. Uh, diamonds, he's saying they're part of the initial makeup of the earth, or they're, you know, formed over long periods of time. That's, a, that's another thing. That's another thing that could be true. Probably more true. Um, I'm trying to think of how, well, okay. Radioactive decay is pretty darn common in our mantle. Um, so go down below the crust in the mantle. We got convecting mantle, but we also have radioactive decay going on. So you have high energy photons, um, not at the same like rate as you would get from solar radiation, um, not at the same rate or intensity, but you do have things producing high energy photons um, down below the surface. So you could very reasonably, I think, get some carbon-14. And if you think about it, um, when that carbon, so let's say we have, we ha let's just say we already have a diamond. We already have a diamond and we bury it really, 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 really deep down into the mantle of the earth. And we, we wait 100,000 years. Well, in that 100,000 year time, most of the carbon-14 that was initially in that diamond would radioactively decay into nitrogen-14, but that nitrogen, it's kind of stuck there. It's not, it's not, I mean, it could maybe eventually diffuse out if it's forming in, it's, it's going to be a gas at those temperatures and pressures. Um, but presumably, if some of it is going to stay put, stay inside the like crystal structure of our diamond, then if we have um, high energy photons coming in um, or neutron radiation, we could repeat the process that happens to atmospheric nitrogen and remake that carbon-14. So it's not inconceivable that we're make, you can make carbon-14 underground. That, that is just me sort of reasoning through that process off the top of my head. Editing Maddie again, uh, I, I looked that up after the fact, and it's, that's basically the right idea. So, so go live Maddie for using her brain. But that doesn't seem very strange to me, if that makes sense. Like, um, I mean, look, if we put that diamond or anything containing carbon, like inside a nuclear reactor, weird things would happen to it, right? So I'm not, I'm not quite sure. What he's saying here doesn't really vibe with me.
These diamonds give a young radiocarbon age, which implies that the Earth is, is very young. So in fact, when we look at the real hard facts of radiocarbon dating and the results that we get... But everything you're saying here, dude, sounds like... I don't want to say intentionally, because I don't know your intent, but it seems like if I can sit here, and I didn't even know this video was going to be about radiocarbon dating until I clicked play, and from undergraduate level classes, uh, I can sit here and reason through why what you're saying is incorrect. Um, and why what you're saying is, it feels very deceptive. Like you really, really, really should know that um, carbon dating is only good for things that are, again, at most, the absolute limit is about 100,000 years old. Um, so if you're knowingly using this inappropriately, right? Like that's not, that's not cool, my dude. We find that radiocarbon actually agrees with the Bible, confirms what the Bible has already said about Earth history. That the um, we're, I think we're done with this video, but what he's saying here is that like, if we intentionally misapply a tool or maybe unintentionally, but if we misapply a tool, then, you know, we can make some stuff fit um and that's not that's not particularly honest now is it um and yeah okay all right so we're done with that video um oh hello this is office grad student maddie who's a codian gremlin um, I had like a whole other video that I reviewed for you guys that was initially right right here, but uh, when I uploaded it to YouTube, the music in the background of the video I was reviewing was um, popping as a copyright issue. So I just went ahead and cut that out. Um, it wasn't anything super fun anyways, um, but I just wanted to let you guys know why uh, this video is ending so abruptly. Um, but anyway, okay, uh, I hope you liked it and I will see you guys soon. Bye team.